All right, Jesse from Poker News here with Greg Merson. Greg, 2012 main event winner. Um, we're hanging out in Hoboken, New Jersey at Greg's house, just uh, catching up. We're on the East Coast road trip, myself and Matt Hansen. And of course, if we're going to hit the East Coast, we want to hit all the, all the big spots. So sitting down with Greg Merson to catch up and see what he's been up to recently. So thank you, Greg, for hanging out with us. Um, yeah, it's been uh, what, now almost 11 years. Yep, so, yeah, a long time. So, I mean, 10 years is a big thing, you know, whenever you have like your 10 year anniversary for high school or college or anything like that. What was it like last year? What the, did you go out to Vegas? Like, what was your. What, yeah, what was definitely. Your... I was there for uh, just two weeks around the main. And um, I guess a good story about going back on the 10 year anniversary is I shaved my head the same way that I had it the year that I won. And um, it was kind of cool. I hadn't done that in a while. And yeah, I made day four of the main last year. And it was just such an awesome experience to go that far again. I hadn't gone far since 2013. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's nothing like going deep in the main. So yeah. I also got COVID during the main. Cool. So that was uh, interesting. On okay. days two and three, I thought that I had zero chance to win based on uh, how tired I was. I felt like I could never win this tournament again. Why am I so tired this early in the event? And then it made sense Yeah. after, yeah. <laughs> so tell us, <clears throat> 11 years ago when you won the main, what was your poker schedule like? What was your what was your day to day when it came to poker? I mean, back then my whole life was poker. I was playing 60, 70 hours a week. I maybe took a few weeks off a year, just all day, every day, eat, sleep, poker. Um, so leading up to the year that I won, Black Friday was the year before, so I moved to Canada to play online. And yeah, it's just like, I mean, just complete degenerate playing all the time, but a good degenerate. Like, <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm, I'm definitely a degenerate poker player. I love playing poker, but I wouldn't say that I'm a degenerate gambler necessarily. Cause yeah. I don't feel like I need to bet on everything all the time, but I love playing poker. Good, good. So how does that compare with what you're doing these days? I know you've got two kids, and you're out here, and you're out in Canada, so obviously uh, you're not playing online poker probably as much. What are you up to these days? So we actually moved to New Jersey in 2013, um, or actually uh, 2014, and I signed with WSOP.com for a year, and I needed to either live in Nevada or New Jersey. My wife wanted to live in Las Vegas. I did not want to live there. <laughs> as, just as a recovering uh, drug addict, I didn't feel like living there full-time would be a good atmosphere for, for me to be around. Sure. And um, so we, we moved here thinking that we'd be here for a year, two years max, and just absolutely fell in love with it. And um, still to this day, I play online in the, in the New Jersey market mm -hmm. and some on the uh, like private apps and then a little bit of private games in New York City. Sweet, nice. So <clears throat> when it comes to how much time you spend compared to 60, 70 hours you know, before, what, the, what would you compare it to these days? Are you still playing? Um, I mean, uh, these, these days I am playing uh, three or four days a week online and yeah. you know, like six to eight hours per day on those work days. So nowhere near what I used to do. And I just don't recover the same way mm -hmm. as I used to when I was younger. And I mean, not that I'm old, I'm 35, but in poker years, I'm old because <laughs> I've been doing this half my life. Yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, I just like my, my uh, brain took a lot of wear and tear on it for the first eight or ten years of playing full-time yeah how about uh, traveling do you feel like you travel a lot since you since you won or what what's your um back then i traveled a lot from 2013 to 15 early 16 i was traveling a good bit not like some of these other guys that were traveling to every tournament stop because i was still playing a lot of cash games mm -hmm. but i was playing maybe 40 or 50 tournaments a year and this is before re-entry was as common as it is now. So I felt like that was a decent amount of volume. Um, and since 2016, I haven't really traveled much for poker. If I'm traveling, it's like strictly for pleasure. And there has been, I've gone to a couple of World Series circuit event stops, one in St. Martin uh, earlier this year, mm -hmm. and then one in Aruba in 2019. Nice. Um, just to kind of do a uh, re relaxing poker trip that's a faster main event. Mm -hmm. structure and yeah. not playing it's not, not like PCA where I'm potentially playing five or six days and not enjoying the weather so that's yeah. kind of what I'm looking to do if I'm traveling for poker outside of going to Vegas I want to go somewhere that I've never been and I can play for stakes that are re relaxing you know if I final table the St. Martin event it's 90k for first it's not like 
two million or something. Right. It's tough to take the family and play for two million. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. let's say eleven years ago, would you say poker was your your number one focus? Like what you when it comes to what your life was built around was poker the top, yeah. top value? Basically from two thousand five through I mean honestly even to this day, really, it's been a, like a, a very high priority in my life to this day. With kids and other responsibilities, there's more going on in my life to have like the sole dedication to just being at the top level of the game. Mm-hmm. But um, I'd say the first 10, 12 years, it was just the only thing that was on my mind at all times. And one of the reasons I knew I was going to marry my wife is because when we first started dating was when every, whenever I hung out with her, I didn't think about poker. And, and that was like such an eye opening thing for me to, uh, to meet someone that took, took me away from Mm -hmm. my brain, always thinking about the game all the time. Yeah. So compare that to today where you sit now, obviously your life is now about your, your family stuff. Would you, I mean, besides your daughters and your wife, what would you be say is your number one focus these days? Um, well, the past year specifically, I haven't been taking care of my health as much as I had done um, since moving here. Really, moving here, I, I I put a lot more focus on taking care of myself. Once that once I stopped traveling as much, early twenty sixteen, I got into fit, health and fitness more. And not that I ever got in like incredible shape, but I I actually was prioritizing training and eating good and like fo- focusing on getting good sleep and all the things to uh, like help with my performance outside of just like getting good at the str- strategic part of poker. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, this past year has been tough with the second kid and moving here and traveling more than we had uh, during the COVID period. So just trying to get into a better routine lately has been my main focus to take care of myself. Absolutely. When it comes to poker history, um, do you have anyone that you look at, look towards, you know, as uh, someone you want to you know, recreate their, hope, like you know, maybe Helmuth or Doyle or Amarillo Slim, or when you look at <clears throat> the the history of poker, is there anyone that you you look at and say that's who I hope to be like or emulate? Uh, that's a really good question. No one's ever asked me that. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I. Uh, I played with Andrew Robel a decent bit online back in the day and then a little bit live when we were in our early 20s. I think we're the same age. And I never had that much respect for his game. I I thought that he was like overrated, tight, whatever. But then I started noticing that he was always in very good games. Mm. And that's just continued times a million at this point where he's gotten to in his career. So he's like a big idol for me at this point even though we're the same age it's that like the legacy that he's gonna live or leave in terms of being an elite professional gambler not just a professional poker player but just the spots that he's put himself in is very uh tough to do and that's mm-hmm. become more of a focus of mine of just like the business side of poker and networking and finding good spots to play smooth let's see what else was gonna go from here Kind of blinked, I blinked. It. I started thinking about inner rubble for a minute. It's like, yeah. just took me out of it. Oh man, where was I going to go from here? No, oh, come on, Jesse. Snap it out of it. <clears throat> okay, Doyle. There we go. Um, you know, we uh, we started this road trip. What was it? Sunday night. As soon as we got off the plane, we heard Doyle had passed away. Like mm-hmm. he passed away while we were flying, and we just weren't connected to the internet or anything. Um, that's huge for the poker world. What uh, what has Doyle's history meant to you personally as a, both a poker player and a main event winner? Yeah, I mean, I I haven't had that many interactions with him in person, but um, I do remember finding out one day that he followed me on Twitter. I f- felt like that was so cool. And just the fact that he was on Twitter at his age was awesome. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, like I never, I don't think I ever got to play with him because um, it would have only been in a tournament. But I spoke to him maybe five or ten times and always had good good interactions but I don't have any good Doyle stories unfortunately I didn't read his book I actually read Helmy's book was the first poker book I read <laughs> Helmy so, would love to hear that that's good yeah he knows that yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. great but uh, Doyle himself I mean just legend to the game obviously a lot of respect for like what he's done and stuff and it's yeah. pretty cool to think about 
all the generations that he went through to where poker is now, you know? Yeah. Because it's very much like a back alley industry 50, 40 years ago. Good Lord, yeah. Yeah. And when he started in Dallas and it was a Texas road game, we're driving across the state with Slim and like what, Sailor Roberts and others and stuff. It was just insane. Um, You know, he, yeah, he played from when he was in his 20s till when he, I mean, he died at age of 89, just short of his 90th birthday in August. Yeah. You're 35. Do you hope to play that long as well? Or what, what do you think? Yeah, would, poker? yeah, I mean, I don't think I'll ever actually retire from poker. I, I definitely will play less. Um, but even that, I'm not even so sure about because talk to me in 20 years when my kids are out the door and I might just be playing like 50 hours a week again because <laughs> what else am I going to do, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I still, love to, I still love to play. And if I could play every day, if I could go back and play the same amount of hours that I did, 10 years ago I, I would it's just that I can't <laughs> like I, I I have enough hours in the day to accomplish that but then I'm not going to have energy for my kids I'm not going to have energy for my wife my dog workouts all that stuff so it's like kind of have to cut back from stuff to give other things attention for sure um, when it comes to a third bracelet do you do you strongly want to add to your collection yeah I mean for a long time I didn't really care so much about getting a third one. I would say the first two or three years after I won the first two, I really tried. Mm -hmm. And then from 2016 to 2020, really until last year, uh, 2022, I I, uh, didn't really like go out of my way to play extra events or go out there for the full summer. But uh, now I'd say it means a lot more to me and I've been making an effort to play as many events as possible. So last year I played between re-entries, probably close to 40 or 50 bullets into things. And the online stuff really helps because I can play mm-hmm. stuff from Jersey. And then even in Nevada, I can play while I'm out there and Absolutely. get more uh, like opportunities. So I made my first final table in eight years, or seven years last year online, and I got third. Oh. And it was, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I just like, you kinda, <laughs> it's really hard to make a World Series final table and then it's just, there's nothing like it, right? So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's like, that's, that's like the taste of success I needed to uh, want to keep chasing that. Night. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Speaking of final tables, do you still communicate with any of the people at your your big final table? Um, yeah, Jeremy Osmus and I are still like pretty good friends in that. I had been friends with um, Jesse Sylvia before then, and I, mm-hmm. I'd say I talked to Jeremy more than Jesse, but still uh, close with Jesse and Russell Thomas as well. Yeah. So I, I guess outside of those three guys, I don't really talk to anyone else too often. Here and there a little bit. Obviously, if I see them in Vegas, then we say hi. But yep, nice. So <clears throat> when it comes to both your bracelets were in No Limit Hold'em, um, do you want to try to win a third bracelet in another game? Do you want to try like a mix or a stud or an Omaha or anything? Yeah, I had started to learn mix uh, last year before the series and then realized I spent a week or two with a study group, a couple sessions, and then realized when the schedule came out that I wasn't going to be there for any of the mix stuff really. So um, I stopped studying those games. But for the past mm-hmm. six years, I've played PLO Cash. And for the past two and two to two and a half years, I've played like some PLO 8 Cash. So. I'm by no means good at either game, but I've played enough hands and uh, feel like I understand the concepts enough to hop in tournaments of those games up to 10K. And at this point, I think I'd probably play the 25K PLO if I was there for, for that on the schedule and um, just not really care if I was a losing player in it just to give myself a chance to, to potentially win a bracelet. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I wish I could say the same thing about some of these no limit high rollers, but I. I definitely would be losing in them, uh, certainly at 50k plus, probably at 25k, and like the pace of play to me is just so enjoyable that I don't want to put myself through that. <laughs> I, I just think um, those high stakes tournaments without shot clocks are just a, a nightmare. Like I just don't want to deal with the tanking, and, and it's just just not enjoyable at all. Whereas if there's tanking in a 10k PLO or 25k PLO, I guess because I'm playing a game that is newer to me and um i I, i'll find uh like watching the hands more a little more interesting than no limits i've played it like half my whole career yeah Um, yeah 
Do you think there's any players that we just don't know of yet who uh, you've had your eye on, <clears throat> either like maybe in your private games or just that you've experienced maybe last summer, who you think are rising stars? Another good question. I mean, the uh, stuff because I come from the uh, cash game side of things, and the, it's it, it's it's tough to know when those guys are going to make the transition to playing tournaments or wanting to play tournaments. There's so many good cash game players out there that don't get any mm -hmm. recognition. Um, but you, playing tournaments is a completely different skill set. So especially now, it's like so much more difficult. It used to be the other way around, where like cash game players would look down on tournament players for the lack of skill that they had because the mm -hmm. tournament game because of the stack sizes is, is so limited in the uh, amount of decisions to be made now with ICM and the fact that specifically 100 big blind cash games online have been solved so so uh, finally mm -hmm. at this point it's like the tournaments because of all the different changing stacks where you are with making the money or the pay jumps whatever like there's so much going on that it we, we've realized that tournament poker is like, in my opinion, the hardest form of, of poker to, to get like elite at. Um, so a lot of respect for those guys that play at that level. I can't imagine how much work they do because it's, uh, yeah. It's like you wouldn't think that playing 17 big blinds or something would be that difficult, but it's really, really hard. So I, I would not do well more stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, <clears throat> I think we're going to wrap this up. Greg, thank you so much for hosting us and for inviting us into your house. Um, I guess the last question would just be, Greg, as you're, as you're hunting that third bracelet, we're just over a week away from the World Series. What is your last-minute planning process like? Now that I mean, you're so close already. Mm -hmm. Between now and when you head to Vegas, do you have any plans to help keep yourself focused or... Yeah, I mean, I definitely have played less volume of poker this month, kind of preparing for how busy it'll be. Mm -hmm. I'm going um, May 30th until the June 8th or 9th by myself, and then coming back for three weeks and going with my family for the last three weeks. So I can really go hard on both trips since I have that break in between. Whereas if, if I was going for the full seven weeks, I would try to play very little poker this month and I'm kind of already going that route anyway it's not like meeting older but yeah my preparation would always be to try and slow down as much as I could because I'm addicted to playing in May because it gets so intense mm -hmm. and uh, specifically the last two three weeks is when you're the most burnt out and that's when the best cash games are running and the, and the best tournaments are running um, historically so um, yeah I mean I'm just kind of living my life and the world series for me it kind of feels like a vacation now because the binds have gone down so much that i'm not really ever playing anything that i'm going to feel like stressed about yeah. even just like uh even just the payouts at the final tables unless i have final table something that's like seven figures for first i'm just not and i'm not trying to brag by any means i just like i played tournaments when i was younger and the buy there I don't know, I guess maybe because I played bigger stakes back then and dealt with those high pressure situations mm -hmm. at a young age that at this point when I'm playing like a thousand dollar tournament or uh, even like a 5k that's like six or seven hundred thousand for first. Like mm -hmm. sure, I, 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 the money means something to me, I'm not going to say it doesn't, but if I make the final table, like I want to win, whereas someone else might be trying to ladder more because mm -hmm. pay jumps are significant, I'm, try, I'm trying to win. so. I had that that came up online last year at 5k final table I think it was um, 320 for first and uh, or high 200s for first and I got 90k for third and the, those pay jumps like I was playing crazy at the final table like I just want I just want to win um, mm -hmm. but everyone has a number right so if I final table the main event and it was 10 million for first I'm not gonna be playing like that <laughs> yeah so yeah Smooth, man. Well, thank you so much, and we wish you luck. We hope that we, uh, well, Pokers will be there, so we'll definitely look for you, and we'll, we'll say hello again when we, uh, when we see you in Vegas, and hopefully we'll be there uh, at your table when you win that third bracelet. Cool. Yeah, that'd be nice. Thanks for coming. Thanks, buddy. Yep.